Wadi of Manhattan, which led me to meet my wife and actually she shaped a lot of my journey because I ended up in North Carolina because she gave me an application to apply to North Carolina Central. <laughs> she, uh, she went on a college tour, she, gave, she had an application where you can apply to every HBCU for like $30 for one price and you can get like, you know, four <laughs> schools or something. And North Carolina Central was the first uh, school to respond. I'm going to North Carolina right here. So by the time my plan was just to like get out of New York, so when that happened, I was like, right, I'm going. So I went to North Carolina Central. Uh, I was there for five years. While I was student teaching, so I first went to art, I switched to art education because I figured I needed a job. And I didn't know anybody making money or successful as an artist. I'm like, even the teachers had to get an art education degree, so let me think about it. But I was still teaching at an elementary school um, in Durham, and they kind of messed up. They told me what the starting salary would be. They were like, oh yeah, so when you finish the starting salary, it's $27,252. And I was like, for the whole year? <laughs> I'm in the building. 
But when I came to the space, they, was, they said, well, what do you think about the main gallery? And I was like, what do you mean the main gallery? I was working on all, like paintings this size because I thought I had a small room. And I was like, no, we think your, your work needs to be upstairs. And at the time, like, nobody ever gets upstairs locally. It's almost like they bring a lot of people in and stuff. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it. So when I started making big hands, and then when I did that show, everything happened. Yeah, a lot of stuff happened. Yeah. Other museums started to buy my work. Um, that's when I got my gallery representation mm -hmm. because they saw me work at the natural. And then they knew I had an upcoming show, so I guess that they did was like getting in while, you know, sure. while the train was moving. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they changed the trajectory of my career too because they started taking me everywhere. Like they took me to art fairs and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So once that happened, and I mean, that was like 2022. No, that was 2021 when that started happening. We're in 2023 now. I mean, I just paint every day now. Like, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the things I thought was, I didn't think were possible ended up being possible. Right. But, yeah. That's amazing. Thank you. That's yeah. exciting. <laughs> Taylor homes, mm -hmm. which no longer exist, they were imploded. Mm -hmm. 
very important. Okay. And I look at everybody's work. I look at, I look at a lot of my contemporaries because, I mean, a lot of them are the places I want to be. So I, you know, I'm looking at everybody's CV. I'm seeing where they went. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm always on sites looking at the directors and the curators because I need to know who I need to talk to to get to where I want to go. So, sure. Yeah, I look at a lot of people's work. I'm interested um, very intensely on your feelings about African Americans in America. I noticed the green, mm -hmm. yes, and I also noticed the theme, I guess, of the red, white, and blue, mm -hmm. of the helmet, of the socks in one of your pictures, mm -hmm. and the other um, very interesting people, characters, mm -hmm. human beings with the red, white, and blue helmets on. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. All right, so that's for this particular uh, body of work. So all my work is in like, red, white, and blue. When I first started, there was a lot of red, white, and blue just because I was kind of exploring my American identity. But the red, white, white, and blue in this exhibition actually comes from the helmet because the helmet was red, white, and blue. Someone gave me that helmet. They were moving and they were like, hey, you want this? So I sat in my studio for a while. And that's kind of how things work, right? I'm looking at it, and I started thinking about, like, man, it looks like a helmet, Evil Knievel would wear it, right? And I'm, then it's like, oh, Evil Knievel was a daredevil. And then I was like, oh, well, I'm a daredevil because I kind of jumped out the window and follow my dreams. But then it's just like, well, you have to be a daredevil to follow your dreams. So then it was just like, okay, I'm going to paint some portraits of my kids to let them know they can do anything they want, but I'm going to let them wear the helmet, like, follow your dream. And then I had done pieces with letter before. But then I went to the studio visit with wine. Actually, while I was working on this stuff. But my glitter never really worked the way it was supposed to. And I talked to Juan, he gave me a tip. And I was like, okay, let me apply it to this work. And then the glitter kind of represents like the dream. So like this portrait right here, it's called The Danger of a Dream Deferred. So this is like me at work before I strapped on the helmet to follow my dream. And it's kind of like how unhappy I was and how it was dangerous if you get stuck in. So it was kind of like strap on the helmet follow your dream in my life might change once I did it. But like I have some things in my paintings like these, which appear a lot. Like I have a body work that I'm working on now. That it's, in it. it's more subtle now, but it's, uh, it represents like being stuck. Like, mm -hmm. or being almost in like bondage. Like I felt like I was stuck in the life I was living before I decided to put it on my own. Um, so there's like undertones of, of course, you know, Americana I work with. In this instance, it just happened to be a coincidence because the helmet, I mean, that's what set it off, so like, I have to include the color. Very interesting, thank you. You've got several that sparkling. Mm, the glitter? What is the other? Oh, the glitter represents the, the dream. So if every painting, is, so basically think of it, uh, if I give you a key, glitter equals dream, right? Like, Helmet is basically taking the chance on the dream. This, this represents like being stuck. So if you have that key and you apply it to every painting, you kind of get a, a bit of the narrative in each painting. I'm sorry. You get a bit of the narrative in each painting. Oh, yeah. Right. So you kind of, if you know what each piece means, you can kind of put it together when you see it. That's right. Juan and I were talking yesterday about the helmets <laughs> and the. Uh, relationship to the dream and he um, you know we were talking about how it also protects mm -hmm. it's a, it's, it protects the organ that allows us to breathe I mean allows us to dream a form of uh, breathing <laughs> <laughs> Well, even with that being said, you're working on with the portraits with the individuals in it, but it's not thoughtful. It's kind of risky. Um, <laughs> uh, aside from, where do you draw your inspiration from? Like, it seems like you go through phases of inspiration, but there's a baseline to it as well. What's the baseline? What do you think through each phase of your art inspires you? I mean, I think the baseline is always like, uh, the well, the one consistently is like family experiences, right? right? Mm -hmm. So it's always like thinking about my kids. So like, the first, Dream portraits were of my kids because you know I had the helmet and I took it, thought about them, and then I expanded it to include like some of my friends' kids and stuff like that. Um, so where am I going? Um, no, just uh, like just the inspiration. Like, what do you 
what you can inspire to. Yeah. Well, I mean, the inspiration now is like, I don't say this is my job, but this is like what I do, right? And so I look at it like I have the opportunity to do this every day, so I'm going to do it every day. Um, I don't know, like, you know, so even when I had a job, I used to like sketch little things on your notepad or whatever, right? But you never do anything with those ideas. Now, all I have to do is something with the ideas. So now when I get ideas, I just make stuff. Like sometimes you guys will never see some of the stuff I make, but I'm always just making it. And then when it sticks, it's like, oh, well, I can get 15 pieces out of this idea and then you just go. Right? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't know why you're making it. Sometimes it's like when I had the helmet, I was like, "What am I supposed to do with this thing?" I just sat it and I saw it every day after making other stuff. And then it was like, "Oh, okay." Then it clicks, right? Sometimes you just have stuff around. And you're just like, "All right, if I see it enough, something's gonna click." It's true. We were uh, Karen and I were visiting uh, Solomon's uh, junk yard yesterday, and uh, the thing that's really great about it is. So much stuff. I mean, I'm sure you can find something in there that you could use. And I always found things that were, I didn't intend to use them in my work, but they certainly inspire you in various ways, you know, like a, a kind of food, if you will. Um, so I, I collect odds and ends that I just keep in the studio. And some things I will, I've used over the years, other things I will never use, but they are always there for me. Um, and I think that's, that's the role of them. And it's not always to, uh, to use all the things that you find out there in the world. Um, and the other thing is, as Clarence was talking, uh, the idea of working on a series, um, over the years I've worked on things that only had 60 or 70 paintings in them. And this current series has uh, a little over 180 paintings mm -hmm. that were done over the past few years. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's only 60 or 70. <laughs>
it's only your intent that matters most. You know? So who are you making this for? Mm -hmm. And you know, that's where I am at this point in my life, you know, at all these years. Um, I work on um, large scale paintings. Uh, the one I'm starting on now is, I guess, um, I think seven by eight feet. Mm -hmm. So large scale paintings, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, down to pieces this size. Mm -hmm. you know? So, um, and I guess I've done, I don't know, um, 350, 400 shows you know, over the years, you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, maybe literally um, several thousand pieces. Um, you know. so, I have yes. a question for Clarence. Do you consider the, the green faces a series, or do you see them as independent works, or do you see that if it's a series, that each is building towards something larger? So, no, the rain phases aren't a series because they're a staple of my work. I've been doing it for the last couple of years. So this is like a series, but even all my series are people green. So that started in 2021. Um, so is the building towards a larger series? Um, or something bigger, because what you mentioned earlier was that when you, when the trajectory of your career shifted, to a museum exhibition in a large gallery mm -hmm. that you felt like you needed to scale up your work. So yeah, I have. So this was a small, this, my big works are small compared to what I do. Like now the smallest paintings I make, I have a, a series of hood figures, they're 16 by 16, but those are really for the gallery. But normally the smallest piece I make is like uh, 48 by 30, 48 by 36. You know, I do like 60 by 72, like that kind of thing. But, yeah, so, yeah, I've scaled up since then. Mm -hmm. How many pieces are are in the In My Hood series? Uh, there's going to be 50. I've got 29 so far. Where is your main art gallery? In Santa Fe, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Is that Count Turner County? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought I saw it. Mm -hmm. Are you going to know? No, no, I mean, I saw it online, and oh, I talk, no. I've had conversations <laughs> Okay. So, so I see that, you know, art is your main vessel of delivering a uh, perceived message mm -hmm. to whoever the audience is. Uh, for some people, going to an art gallery just isn't in their nature. Do you also convey the same message that you um, distribute with your art in other mediums by any chance? Because I think it's a strong message that anybody can try and digest. Uh, I guess the medium of conversation. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah I mean, I, I do talks all the time. I talk to people all the time. Uh, my studio is pretty much open, so I, I meet people all the time. I let, so the building is close to the public, but I let people make appointments and come by all the time. People come by and bring their kids or their mom, like, just come and sit in and talk and ask questions. Like, yeah, so I mean, these are people like I know they aren't coming, so they don't want to buy anything. They really just want to show like their kid, like, oh, you can be an artist. And I always say yes, because I never had that growing up. So I'm like, all right, come by. Mm -hmm. That's cool. What are you in? In Raleigh, North Carolina. I find that art is just so calming and relaxing <laughs> and rejuvenating. In this day and time, in this world where there is so much confusion and anger and um, death, um, all, all in combination, and just to sit or stand or lay down on the floor and just look at something <laughs> beautiful on the ceiling, to me is so relaxing. I oftentimes see on TV and the paper and stuff about starving artists. <laughs> <laughs> and now artists have a hard time often times making a living. As you mentioned, uh, you got like 27,000 to a lot of people. That's pennies to someone who has to raise a family and pay the bills. Pay the car and buy the gas, etc. Yeah. That's not a whole lot of money. No, that's why I said no. Because <laughs> <laughs> okay. you have to meet the bottom line. 
Fires. Um, and who was it? It wrote. Forgive me for forgetting the person that's your face in my mind. But anyway, this lady was an artist. And her life was spent doing some other things. She had to teach, she had to do maid work, etc. And somebody told her who knew her potential, quit your job. Do what you need to do with your artwork. Mm -hmm. And she did. And the rest was history. Mm -hmm. So again, I say to you, I'm just so thrilled and enthusiastic and all that wrapped up in one. Mm -hmm. An honor to have you here in Sumter for a little while. I wish, I pray that some of your work were to remain here just for folks to see mm -hmm. and enjoy. And <laughs>
I know who that person was. I was thinking about Toni Morrison. Oh, Toni Morrison. Oh, yeah. Okay. And she had done a lot of work, and um, one of her mentors said, quit that job, mm -hmm. go to work writing, you are an author, you're a writer, mm -hmm. and the rest was history. So you just keep on doing it. It's funny because I did quit my job, but I don't want to give anyone that advice. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a lot more than that, right? You quit your job, you ain't got a lot of free time, but right. now what do you right. do? Right. 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 I kind of was like super dedicated because I was like, okay, I'm going to give this a thousand percent if it doesn't work. Yes. I can only be a truck driver. So yes. I still had a plan B. I didn't want to use it. Yes. But you know, I still had, you know, 12 years experience. Right? Yes. I go back and drive a truck. <laughs> but I committed to it. Like I was, even now, I pay all day. When I go home, I still pay. Yes. Right? Like we eat yes. dinner and I, mean, I have work in the dining room right now. She's like, you got a whole studio when you get out of the house. <laughs> but it's because, like, I'm always in a supply and demand. Like, yes. right now there's yes. a huge demand, so I want to keep up with it. But yes. It was still, I don't want this to end, so I'm always going to keep doing it. Tell us about the collage. So the collage, I did a lot of collage in 2021. Um, so between like 2018 and 2021, I, I was painting a lot, right? And I, of course, I look at a lot of art forms and I look at collage. I was looking at a lot of people doing collage, and I was like, man, I don't do sculptures. So I was like, what else can I do besides like paint? I'm painting like all the time. So I started with like one collage and it kind of was like collage and paint. And then I kind of like scaled it down to just simple collages. So I started like going to bookstores and getting a bunch of old magazines. Like I have tons of magazines. And I haven't done a collage since 2021. But when the pandemic happened and no one was like really showing like that you couldn't do anything, I started this thing like every Friday I would post a collage on my Instagram page. And I don't even have a big following, I have like a thousand followers. But within 10 minutes, the collage was sell. So I was like, oh man, that's a paycheck. So for like the whole pandemic, every Friday, I would just post a collage. I'm like, it was just go. It was. But then I kind of went back to painting. So I probably did that for like three or four months. And then I was like, okay, let me just paint. Like, because it was taking time away from painting because I was like, I gotta get. And they look simple, but like, I can make a painting in a couple of days. That collage might take a week. Like, and it's, like oh, it's only four things, but you have to find it. Oh, you have to come up with an idea. Like, so I started doing series after a while. I can only make three in a series, four in a series, and then when Friday comes, all right, I'll let, let one go. So I started for me. It was, I, mean, I should go back to it, but. They're very important. Yeah, they were popular for a while, and then the paintings kind of took over because. The paintings were going to like institutions and galleries and the collages. We're going to like regular people, but I don't want to talk about money. You know, there's a big difference. <laughs> I mean, there's a big difference between the collages and the paintings. So it's just like, we want steak or we want like, you know, food and So it's kind of like, so I made, I made the collages to be accessible. And I think that's why they were so successful because at the time the prices of the paintings were rising when the collages were still really affordable. Mm -hmm. And people, at that point, I mean, they kind of saw what was happening, and I just want to get something. So like, I was posted. Mm -hmm. I probably didn't post one every day, but I wanted to keep the hype up, and I wanted people to know it would come on Friday. <laughs> like, I even did one Friday, instead of just uh, selling it, I said, oh, it's going to be an auction. You have until, like, 5 o'clock, well, this <laughs> high school. But it went for the same price that it went, like, $50 over or something. But I was like, I can just sell this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, you know, I was just trying everything back then to try to see where I fit in. And then after before I had a gallery, so I was kind of like, all right, I need to see what I can do on my own. Oh, yeah. You know, it's always funny when artists talk about uh, the whole notion of making money and uh, having it as a career. Most kids, um, particularly African American kids, never think that they can actually be artists. They just don't, you know. Uh, they, they can be a graphic designer, you know, or something along those lines, but not just a fine artist. Um, and then when you get into many institutions, they don't really uh, teach you to be a fine artist. Mm -hmm. Not really. Um, and for everything that goes along with being an artist, uh, as you mentioned earlier, schools just don't teach you all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's the whole thing, I can teach you how to paint, but teaching you how to paint won't make you an artist. Mm -hmm. That's about materials and techniques. That's not becoming an artist. There's so much more involved in that. You know, it, um, uh, I use my work to put my kids through 
college, so when they finish, they know when to buy anything and I didn't either. Um, my daughter would call me and say, you know, tuition's going to be due in a couple of months. You need to sell something. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I would sell something, and you know, that's how those, the tuition got paid for everybody. You know? um, certainly it's doable, but you, it's something that we rarely think of in terms of uh, how artists survive as artists. You know? um, and because of how the system is structured, just um, nationally and internationally, uh, generally speaking, uh, we, I was at our conference at Harvard, and it was really interesting that they were discussing the black canon of American art, as if they had to be one, mm -hmm. as opposed to the canon of American art. Mm -hmm. And it seemed sort of senseless because, um, and I think it was maybe Vogue magazine that used to publish the art universe uh, annually, I think. And the art universe was this universe, of course, that we think of in terms of the planets and so on and so forth. You remember saying that? And it was really interesting in that you think of all the supernovas and all the, the planets and on and on and on. It's just that we weren't part of it. And I, at, at that, in that moment, I fully expected Romain Pierre and someone like him to be a part of that you know, art universe. He was not. I think maybe Basquiat was, and that was the only person. It's the whole notion of um, the art history books, then and now, you know, and all those art history books that I wrote that we were not a part of. Uh, I bought this coffee table book that was out of the 20th century, and it was really interesting. And went through the whole thing, you know, and wonderful photographs and all that sort of thing. And it's sort of a global examination of the uh, art of the 20th century. It's just that there were no people of color in the entire book. So I carried it back to the bookseller, and I said, clearly the editor has made an error here. Mm -hmm. I said, there's no way in the world, when you think about a world that is four fifths people of color, that we're not a part of that, you know, what was happening in the 20th century. How is it possible? So he stopped carrying the book, and I returned the book and got my refund. However, the fact that it was published at all was the problem. Mm -hmm. And it is, it does come down to the issue of expectations. If you buy a book and we're not a part of it, did you expect to see a state in the first place? And generally speaking, many people did not and would not expect to see us there. Not in great numbers. So the idea that, you know, even with this whole conference, that we were discussing the idea of having to have the black cannon of America on it. Seems a little bit silly. Because we've always been here. So, I mean, it's, it's the whole notion of how do we talk about these things, how do we engage in conversation that deals with these things? Because there are a lot of issues. You know, I think it's, it's looking at Clarence's work, looking at my work, and looking at so many thousands of other African American artists in this country. A lot of people that are black, simply black and brown who are making art forever. And it's, it's, it's almost as though, are we coming to the surface now because of where we are now? Are we simply just now being discovered? Is it sort of like America being discovered when people are already here? <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like that, like it's something it's, new? It's just now being valued, yes. not discovered. Well, I mean, is that how America was valued? Sure. It was just well, now valued. I mean, you know, it's, it's and its resources, and we are those resources. We always have those resources. You see. Yes. So, but that's an issue about interpretation. So, in, in the past, I'll remember this because I was in New York when Sharon Tavney and Mary Schmidt Campbell wrote the monograph on Lamar Beer. Mm -hmm. And the New York Times critics, Peter Pelagans, and um, people who were the people that they looked to for opinions were shocked that these two black women had the temerity to say Robert Bearden had a place in the history of American art. Mm -hmm. um, and how could they, how dare they? How came the, the narrative? This is 1990s, so it's not long ago. Right. Whole well, 30 years ago. <laughs> More than 30 years ago. So it was about accessibility and understanding. So whenever people talked about the works of African American artists, in the past, in the Harlem Renaissance, and forth, they would default to things like, oh, Negro spirit and spirituality and color, and oh, that feeling, because there was no understanding of the intellectual, the inner life of an African American person, and it was taken for granted that it just wasn't there in the law. Mm -hmm. So the interpretation problem was always a big problem, and it's lessening now, but I mean, I 
listen to or you see that, well, I've, and I've read that your work is about your African American experience. So if I'm a critic, let's say I'm committed to Donald Trump's ideas, mm -hmm. and I'm going to come into a gallery and I'm looking at your work, whereas my access would become a thing because of the identity politics that were part of the, the Western Canada as much as anyone else, mm -hmm. but then you've got the uniqueness of experience that's always a challenge. So who is writing about and, and sort of trying to execute the ideas and helping the artists articulate the messages becomes an issue. And I used to write for the Post and Courier down here, and I refused to let them post a picture of me because mm -hmm. I didn't want anyone to read what I was writing and think, oh, this is a black critic talking about black, you know, but I was talking about everybody's art. And I was, I won't tell you who the person was, it's somebody who, well, I think we might know. And she saw me in the Gibbs Museum doing research to write about an article. And she's like, what's she doing here? I said, oh, I'm writing an article. She said, you're Frank Martin? She said, oh, yeah. And she knew me. <laughs> you're Frank Martin? There are a lot of Frank Martin. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of Frank Martin. I'm not the best ball coach, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you're the Frank Martin that writes for this. I said, yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> this is someone who'd known me at that point for years. You mean you wrote this? I was like, yeah, that's me. And this is a person of color. She didn't have the expectation that I would be the person who could do that. Although I'm teaching art history, I'm you know, writing it at that, that time to write a lot of things for the um, South Carolina Arts Commission. I've written stuff about you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but it's just not, they don't associate this intellectual responsibility. But now, you changed that a little bit with Selma Golden because of that show she did. But what's the show that got her attention at the Bible, you know, at the, at the uh, Whitney? Mm -hmm. You know, blackness sure. yeah. so you have to do something about like black, and, but she's still marginalized, she's still um, categorized as a black critic, which is how you end up with this black camp. So that's how that comes because people are separated in their, in, their, in their heads. When you know you enter with the work of art, you might start with the form of your work with Juan's work. I was always start with the formalist analysis. Mm -hmm. So if you're a consciousness, if you're a phenomenologist and you're just looking, what does any consciousness see? And if I look at your works, I see immediately this interest of texture and color and composition and this sort of centrality to the things that you're presenting. And so anyone can enjoy it right away. But then I see a bicycle helmet and you're painted green. So that's something that might be very personal iconographically. And I might be just lost, like, well, why is it, you know, this very flat colors, and it's red, black, and green. There's also red, white, and blue. Does that mean something? You know, I don't know where to go now because I'm not sure what the experience of a person of African descent painted in America might be. I mean, I'm sure, I'm, I know what I would think. But I'm just saying that that becomes an issue because the artwork is always a communication. So do I get the message or do I not get the message? It becomes the problem. You know, Frank, is this interesting. I was involved in a conversation with a gentleman Ohio. And he was saying that there was never going to be um, any great abstract expressions, black abstract expressions. Because when you think of the first generation, second generation of abstract expressions, I mean, you know, Arthur and all the other guys, mm -hmm. right? Ross Klein and all that, that there would never be any black you know, abstract expressions in America. It's a black new expression. <laughs> but, and what he was saying is that that time had come and gone, mm -hmm. and, and they were not a part of that conversation. I said, well, where would that leave you know, Ed Clark and where would that leave Mark Bradford and, mm -hmm. and folks like that? You know? I said, have they not done enough to, uh, and surely they have, of course. Uh, you know, Norman but, Lewis. And Norman Lewis. Yeah. I mean, there's a long list, mm -hmm. long, long list. Um, but, just, just, but in the same way that we think in terms of what works by our Americans, but that can be in what it generally is. Mm -hmm. um, we often think, I'm looking at the drawing that you're wearing, here it's all bright colors, absolutely gorgeous. However, we see, don't, we don't necessarily see that as abstract, and we look at all the fabrics from Africa, mm -hmm. and never see this coming from a bundle land, so to speak, right? Well, and yet, we look at, you know, we look at the figure as saying more about us mm -hmm. than that fabric that's coming from the homeland, you know, that always has come from, and how abstract Africa really truly is. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say this, and I'm move on, that Frank thinks what you're saying, I apologize for okay. interrupting. No, no. Frank wrote an essay about me, and um, <laughs> a lot of people are still trying to interpret that essay. <laughs> 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 oh, Frank, 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 is, Frank is one hell of a philosopher. I mean, in, yeah. in the truest sense of the word, he really is. Which is what he also teaches, and I mean, philosophy is just him 
and through and through and through. You beat me because I was going to say, I don't right. see how anybody could have like characterized the characterized you based on the way you write as to whether you're writing from a black perspective. <coughs> it's just unbelievable. Do you remember, Harry, do you remember when uh, Mark Bradford, did any of you know Mark Bradford's work? Uh, Mark Radford is this adult person who's got a, got an account of it. He's probably one of the most famous uh, abstract artists working in America today. Not African American artists, but famous artists working in America today. In the world. And he's just a wonderful, wonderful guy. He really is from LA. Uh, and he's, I guess, in his, in his mid to early to mid 50s now. No. Uh, but he was commenting on the whole notion of the whole post black and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But he, what he said was so when I climb a mountain, and I come back down and do a painting about that mountain. You know, does it become a black painting about that mountain? Or does it be a painting about that mountain? Because that was my experience. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a tendency to see to want to categorize, to marginalize, to do all those kinds of things, to say, well, a black person did this, so it must be this is what black art is. This is what art is. Are you willing to go far enough to see this is what art is? Period. This was done by an American artist. Right. Period. It's only in this country that I'm written about as African American artists. I can leave the country and be written about as an American artist. Mm -hmm. Who feels the need to do that? Yeah. To marginalize that way? I mean, I think there are questions that need to be, that should be raised, that are often raised. Mm -hmm. It's just not always raised in the, the, the right room so those who need to hear it can actually hear it. Mm -hmm. That's all. Well, you can't get away from the biography because, as an artist, part of what you're sharing is your experience, and yeah. you articulate your experience into an object, something externalized that we are then free to engage with and interpret. And we're going to interpret it wrong. I mean, that's even the critics are wrong, or at least, but are different. And critics see things in your work that you may not have intended to show, but which is part of their experience. Which they're they're interpolating from what you've done. And, that's always going to happen with someone looking at the work because you do have to do it as an active interpreter. You're listening to my voice right now, and people are differently interpreting what I'm saying because of the tone of my voice and the way I sound. So we can't get away from that. So there is some of that, what Herod just said, the uh, balkanization of identity. Some of that is there. But then we also, for most of us who are Americans, we have shared experience as people in American culture. So there are things you're all going to suddenly probably understand from that, but then there's also that unique aspect of it that's, you know, but if it's something that a majority of the people can identify with slightly more, it's still interpreted differently. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a challenge. That's a whole new conversation. Yeah. 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 But then I think the thing that's also interesting is that uh, I'm particularly looking at uh, feminist work is that it really opens us up to a much, much larger conversation if we want to have it. But yeah. it's a conversation with everything else that's going on. Sure, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. That's, that's one of the things I enjoy most of this work. Yeah. Yeah. And then you come and destroy the conversation. You just took it in another direction, which I think is I the first surprise yeah. exactly. that it is larger conversation sure. that we should be having. Um, and yes, it started with Clarence saying that he turned down a job for $27,000. <laughs> and, and Clarence, I can tell you that um, that nothing compared to when I got my first job at the Columbia Museum of Art. And my salary was 8000 And I was elated. Were you part time? No. Not only was I full time, I was 24 7 full time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was a big South Carolina salary. Yeah. At a certain time. Yeah. How is it to young relatives? Oh, Yeah, I was going to ask when was it? 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 I was going to ask when was I mean, this speaks of my age and all that sort of thing, not what I'm doing this, but I sold my first painting for $25. Yeah. And I was really happy because I made well that night. Well, that's <laughs> <good>. <laughs> <laughs> I had a beer. <laughs> but, it, but I think that, you know, um, in that moment, it wasn't so much about the fact that it was $25 as much as it was a 
sell. It was my first sale ever in life. You were professional. That could make something that I could sell. Right. Um, and it's been a joyful journey the whole time. I mean, I, after doing it all these years, I'm sure Clarence feels the same way on whole stages. He doesn't get much better. It really doesn't. You know, it's, it's great to have the opportunity to do it full time. It really is. I'm still scared to wake up. Let me 
we'll see about it. But just a little, little bit of a little bit, right? That one right there, that's my first go. Let's see what this pink looks like against the pink on the like, I'm just playing around with colors. So it's not some little gender assignment because of... It probably was. Those were okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I think 
Yes, if I had bought the original, the first painting, mm -hmm. and I found out that you'd made another one, I would never trust to buy anything else from that from you again. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't. But I think you can stop beating yourself up. No, I, I, I took it as a lesson, so I, I know that that route is just not for me. Yeah. And I don't really do commissions like that. Every once in a while, I do one. That, like you come to me with an idea and it speaks to me, I feel like, okay, cool, I'll do it. But most of the time, I don't do commissions. And I'm lucky enough to not have to. Right. What time is it? 2.30. Good time to talk. It's 2.30. Any other questions? <laughs> In the same vein of that, how often do you feel conflicted? Like, if you make a piece of work that you just you finish it and you're like, you know, this is fire, like, I'm going to keep this. Like, this, just, this is just a staple in my work, my commitment to my habit. <laughs> So I'm not the one that makes that decision. So I usually keep one. I try to keep one from every series, but it, my wife is usually the one like you can't sell that one. Like keep that one. <laughs> so I'll show it, but I won't sell it. Okay. Um. I mean, every new painting to me, I feel like it's fine, all right. But that's just because I made it. So I get better with every painting. Like I tell everybody. So there's some paintings like I made a painting the other day. I'm like, man, I made that. Because mm -hmm. I think about myself like five years ago, I could have made that painting. Right. But I don't really have the. Um, Attachment to like, oh, I need to hoard it. It's kind of like now, for the most part, especially when I make big paintings, I'm like, what institution do I want this painting to go to? So I pull the out and say, hey, I want this to go here, and then you know it's up to them to make it happen. But yeah, now I want the work to just be out in the world. Now, is did the North Carolina Museum of Art purchase everything is everything? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was going to say, it was, it seemed to me that of all those YouTube videos you watch, mm -hmm. was there a business one that told you business apart because <laughs> that's an important component? I um, I think, well, I mean, I didn't become an, an artist technically until I was 35, so at that point, you know, I've experienced a lot of business, so I kind of, I had that. And then, I don't have, I think it's because I don't have nothing to lose, like, right, we're just like, nah, I'm doing this, I know I have to make money to do this if I'm doing this all the time. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, I talked to, I did a bunch of studio visits talking to people about, and everyone was uncomfortable, like, about talking about money. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, well, how do you sell work? And he thought, well, you know, I negotiate, I was just like, that's why you got a job. <laughs> so, right, so then it was just like, talking to other people and just figuring it out, and then I talked to some did it full time and then they had a whole structure like this is what you know this is why and I was like all right cool I can take some of that so it's really just taking a little bit from everybody I had conversations with and then you know sometimes you don't take anything but then sometimes it's just like okay whatever you're doing is working but I just want I need to like your level of stuff. I can use that. Yeah. But I think along with the way you were talking about higher education producing artists it's like yeah they can show you the process and the materials. I think maybe that's what you were alluding to, the business side, the, All of it. the writing. Yeah. The I used to talk to, um, I was director of graduate studies for a while, and it was really interesting to me that, I said the unfortunate part is that you will finish this school with the MFA, mm -hmm. and you'll go out to the world, and the only experiences you've had are those you have here at school. So when a student comes up to you, and you had somebody else's college or university, and asking you about this gallery, this museum, this curator, this whatever it is, you can't answer that question because you haven't had those experiences. Because you don't know. And no one ever taught you. And you haven't, you're not old enough, so to speak, in the field to have those experiences. So what do you tell them? The only thing you can't do is assume on to someone else who may have that experience and that knowledge. I was up at Clemson a couple weeks ago. We were actually having that exact conversation about how that needs to be built into the curriculum. It does. It really does. With the special gallery system. Well, just the whole business side of it. But you know what? I'll go What's funny? So I watched a YouTube video, 50 Cent. <laughs> and, it, and this is something I applied. Um, he was talking about school because, you know, he has like no secondary education in there. And he was just like, all the people who work for me have a business degree. Mm -hmm. And he was like, the thing is, they go to school to 
learn my business, but if they really knew how to run a business, they wouldn't be teaching you how to run a business. You get what I'm saying? Like, people go to school to get a business degree from people who don't have businesses. Right. Right? So, but then they end up working for somebody with a business. So they show you how to run a business, but they don't show you how to own a business. And it's the same thing with our school. They show you how to be an artist, they don't show you how to have an art career. So you end up working, you end up being somebody's studio assistant, or starving artist, or something like that. Or even just opportunities yeah. out there. True. Yeah. I had a assistant one time, she had an MFA. I don't have an MFA, but she ended up in my studio, you know, paying my back. So it was just like, you really, I really, yeah, it's like they don't teach you about business. And she was asking me questions all day, and I was just like, let me tell you what to do, but I guess you're going to not work for me much longer once I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I, I think it's not suggesting for a moment that all schools uh, there are some schools that do a superb job. Yale does a superb job. Oh, you, you're on that pipeline, then yeah. No, that's okay. Yeah. They do a superb job. I mean, they, I mean, they bring people in constantly who can teach you, tell you, let you know exactly what's what, and when you leave there, there's a network out there to support you. Mm -hmm. You've got New York City gallery and Of course, you have everything you need. Before you leave there. Before you leave. And, and I think that it's not that it's impossible to have that. Other schools can offer that. They just don't. They don't, that's right. You know, that's it's, it's the idea that I was doing um, a talk <laughs> and I showed this university, uh, HBCU, years ago. And the primary person teaching African American art history did not teach, teach past the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. He said nothing important happened after that. Mm -hmm. So the students leaving there and going to somebody else's college to try to get an MFA i so ill prepared. They know it's nothing. Was this essential? I'm just saying. No. <laughs> I'm not gonna call it a name. I'm just saying that it's disheartening. It is. And the whole time I was director of graduate studies, we did not accept a single student from HBC. Mm -hmm. Because they were not prepared. Right. So Clarence, yeah. how did you get black, uh, gallery representation at Turner Carroll? So they only represent museum like the artists? And, and a lot of African American artists. Right? No, they just, that's new. That's new. Yeah. That's, that's new. after me. But that's after you? <laughs> it's been reported, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's definitely after me. Um, so they had one, they had Mildred Howard before me, and that was the only person on their roster. Of color? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, they had Hong Lu, but I mean, uh, African Americans, and yeah. Mildred Howard. But, um, so, uh, Ty and Turner Carroll is on the board at the Nashville. So when I was in that exhibition and the Nashville purchased my work, mm -hmm. they asked me to do a studio visit and then they found out about the other places that collected my work. So then they asked me, you know, how do you build a representation? And I was always, like, skeptical of representation. But, um, I know, uh, what is his name? The curator at the Nashville, he was talking to me about them. He was like, oh, no, they're really good people. So when they asked her to me, I said yes, and then they had meetings and they changed my prices and stuff, and I was just like, I'm not comfortable. So some of the numbers, and we, we still didn't go that far, but some of the numbers to me were like, who's going to pay these prices for my work, right? Because they were like, what are you talking I'm telling them, and they were just like, well, how much do you need to make? I said, I can't make less than what I'm making now because I'm doing this on my own. Like, what do you bring to the table? And they was like, well, we see your prices here. And I was just like, when? Like now, and I'm just like, <laughs> baby steps, right? I'm like, and they've gone up in the last year. I told you. I mean, they're still, I, they're, I they're still, still on. It was like they're still not to the prices that initially, you know. They, they wanted to bring you bring your prices down. No, they uh, wanted to bring uh, it up. No, yeah, they bring my prices like twice. But you know more. why? Because they they have to factor in their percentage also, and they still want you to get what you're going to get. Yes. So I mean, they more than double my prices originally. And then they still, I think they went up like another 15 percent, and I think they went up one more time. But either way, they're still not to the numbers that they wanted originally. And I was like, well, we can do that once you sell painting. And the next day they called me and was like, okay, we sold two. <laughs> and I was like, all right. And within that first year, I think we sold like 59 paintings. What? Yeah, yeah that's right. That first, I mean, this year we probably did like maybe 30 paintings, but. 
It's more than a pain in the week. Yeah, they know they're marked. Oh, yeah, they will know. They're so pain in the week. Yeah. Um, and then, like, every time we do a fair, like, they'll sell the work at the fair, and then they'll come back, like, okay, we got this one, this one, this one. So, so they're always going. That's why I speak to them, like, once a week, like, hey, what are you working on? What do you have? Like, <laughs> well, but that makes sense. But can you describe who your collectors are? Do you know the profile of your collectors? I don't know. I think that would be helpful, too. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it depends on where I show. So luckily, I don't have an exclusive contract. So like, there's a gallery in Durham that I show at. Um, they just, they really just open, but they have a lot of connections. Um, they sold six bands for me last month, and five of them went to like African American collectors. Hmm. Turn and Carol. So if they sold, let's say they sold 100 paintings for me, and maybe 10 African Americans. Hmm. But then they get me into like more institutions too, and more like high profile collectors. So like their collect like, Turner Carroll, someone will come in and you know spend twenty thousand on a painting, whereas in the other gallery I might sell you know ten to actually no they did sell twenty thousand on a painting, mm -hmm. but Turner Carroll is more like yeah, they're consistent. Yeah, they yeah. find tell, yeah. and they'll buy like two, whereas the other gallery, I'm like, hey, I want to be in a museum. They're like, oh yeah, great. <laughs> I can tell Turner Carroll like they called me yesterday the Minneapolis museum just bought a piece. But because I made this painting, um, Invisible Man, where I kind of play in the position of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh man, I want that to go to Minnesota. So they called them, but they were like, oh, well, that painting is like traumatic to our community. Mm -hmm. But then they went to my file and I said, well, what about this painting? So they actually, they bought a painting. I was like, oh, is that easy? Like, okay, I want to be, you know, a <laughs> Ruby, not Ruby, Prince of Bridges. Like, that's the next one I want to go to. So I'm just going to tell them. That, they make it happen, so they they a really big gallery, but that's what it's all about. Yeah. But yeah, I mean I would like to have a gallery that sold to more African Americans uh, collectors, but I guess I think it's hard when you get into some of these price points. Like I don't think my price points are even crazy. Like I go to these fairs and I see some of these prices and I'm just like <laughs> people are really paying, but they are. But it's all about access too, right? They try to carry on doing it 31 years, so they have a lot of access and they're in the growth, they build those relationships. Whereas they aren't. I don't they're a high dollar market. Makes like the, you know. Yeah. Well, some of the people on their roster are so established that it demands their price. I'm just happy to be on that roster because you yeah, look you're, at Yeah, I think you're an exception. So. <laughs> you're saying a lot of the artists on their roster mm -hmm. are really well established. Mm -hmm. And you said you just became a professional artist at 35. So I'm saying that that makes you an exception to the rest of the ones on the roster. Uh, Correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. yeah. And since they didn't really represent any uh, African American painters, I think by having me, it introduces them, introduces them to the market too. So, right. So they, I mean, I think it's a win-win for both of us right now. And because it was so successful for me, they started taking chances on other. Stephen Hayes is there now. Stephen Hayes is there, but Stephen Hayes is sculpture. Stephen, I mean, that's my friend. Actually, I introduced them to Stephen Hayes. But, yeah, I mean, there's stories there, but yeah. I think I know some of the stories. Okay. But I do want to go back to something you said really early. I know we need to wrap this up, but which is why when you said the difference between the works on paper and the paintings. Mm -hmm. The works on paper have um, has historically been a way to make art accessible to the larger audiences mm -hmm. or buyers. Mm -hmm. um, I will never be able to buy a twenty thousand dollar painting. Don't say that. But <laughs> but I can buy. Well, not today. Let me just say that mm -hmm. today I can. But I can buy a work on paper. And many of the most significant artists in the 50s and 60s did printmaking mm -hmm. to, so that people like us could afford it. I actually just did a little bit graph on Santa Fe. Is it no No, yep. It's in my studio right now, and I have not opened the box. Wow. Two reasons. Yeah, it was an edition of 30s in my gallery. Okay. Keeps calling me, asking me, like, when are you getting back? I'm hesitant on doing it because if we do like it, yeah. Go ahead. 